Good morning. Um, welcome back. I'm glad to see so many people survived. Um, the keynote speaker this morning is Jure Leskovitz. Um, and in trying to introduce him, I've done what I've always do. I read his CV, but then I've started asking people around about um, who he is, how he's doing, uh, what are the most uh, important things about him. And the result was, um, well, not surprising, but I would say impressive, because it seems that Jure is um, a pop star in his area. So there are so many things that, so many people that I've heard that know him and admire him and, and so on and so forth, um, that I thought instead of giving this introduction, I would do um, uh, something else and I will uh, allow his fan base to talk. And one of his biggest fans that I met is sitting here. This is Paul. And Paul will now introduce you to his hero, Jure Leskovitz. Wow. I feel like a 12-year-old at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> no, uh, really, I'm really impressed with uh, Yuri's work. He's really led the way in how to do large-scale data mining on big networks. So an interesting thing about being a computer scientist is that we have many different areas we can be in. We can be theory, we can be application-oriented, we can write good software. And he does all three. So I'll just give you a few examples because there are really a lot. In terms of theory, I think he's really led the way in developing algorithms for knowledge discovery in large-scale networks, really amazing algorithms and representations. In terms of applications, uh, you may know him from things like MemTracker, which help you understand how information goes through blogs, or his big analysis of Twitter, but I recommend you look at a more, probably a, a, a paper that most people don't know, is one in JCDL that tells you how to cite for high impact. So that's a really good paper to read. And finally, for me, when I tried to get into network science, uh, the Stanford um, network analysis platform, piece of software that's available open source, really made it easy to get into. And he's already also produ produces open data sets. So for me, this is why you know, I'm very, very impressed. And it's really helped me as a researcher knowing what he is doing and seeing how he's leading the way. So I'm really excited about this talk. OK, um, okay uh, thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, So I really hope that um, no one's childhood dreams will get destroyed after hearing this talk. Okay, so uh, great. So um, what I'll talk about today is um, ways how to analyze, quantify how information flows flows through online networks, which basically means social networks, but also mainstream media. And what we'll basically look at is a set of techniques, a set of tools that once applied to large scale data give, can give us many different insights about how media space works and um, so on. So it's sort of, it will be case studies of algorithms and sort of cute results. Um, and this has been a joint work with um, some of my students, um, Lars Backstrom, who's at Facebook, Andreas Krause, who's at ETH uh, in Zurich, and John Kleinberg, who was my uh, postdoc advisor. Okay, so um, if we start, um, how does information reach us, right? To, there are sort of two basic ways, among many others, how information can, can come to us, right? And the first way is that it reaches us through word of mouth, right? Sort of through, through our personal um, uh, or through personal influence of um, social networks and our connection in the social networks. Um, another, post, another way how information reaches us is through basically these mass transmissions from the mainstream media, right? Sort of mainstream me media is like pouring information on, on top of our networks, right? And the question is, how does this information that is transmitted by the media, how does it in interact with the influence arising from the social networks, right? And the, one of the first people who were uh, theorizing about this were um, Katz and Lazarsfeld, who come up with um, what is called the two-step flow model, where the idea is that we have mainstream media here in the center, and then a set of influencers, right? So um, the stars that then further spread this, this through their influence um, to the 
uh, to the rest of the population, let's say, this news and things like that, right? Um, and what is interesting here is that there is sort of this tension between global effects that are sort of coming or being caused by the mass media that is um, putting out or creating large amounts of information and these local effects that arise from our um, personal uh, social network structures, right? And um, if we would want to understand, quantify, somehow reason about these kinds of phenomena, traditionally this has been very hard both to, to capture, get the data at uh, scale uh, large enough and also quantify the effects of uh, sort of this interaction between, let's say, mainstream media and uh, social networks. However, today the, there is a sort of one difference that made, made this to some possible to some extent, right? In, and is the explosion of, let's say, online media and especially online social media, right? So this now, today, we have digital traces of sort of, ev in some sense, of everything, right? From, from the mainstream, traditional mainstream media, which means TV stations, newspapers, and news agencies all have, all, all leave traces on the web, all the way down to, to the influence arising from our social networks, which, which we could think about um, as, um, as uh, either microblogging, so platforms like Twitter, or blogs, which can, again, sort of be professional and sort of closer to traditional media to some extent, and also very personal, right? So everyone can, create a blog, right? So this kind of data today allows us that first we can collect it in massive amounts, and then it allows us to study this interaction between global effects arising from the mainstream media and the local social network effects, which what I mean here is mostly blogs um, and Twitter, right? So um, if, I, um, if, if I sort of build on, on this dichotomy between the two, the, the thing is that blogs, internet, and social media today sort of change the way media works, right? So the first thing is that uh, because of blogs, um, this dichotomy between global effects and uh, sort of small local effects is evaporating, right? So today anyone can open a blog and sort of reach in, 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 in a sense um, any, any size of population they want, right? So there is no, no boundary between being able to physically print a paper and distribute it and sort of talk to your friends, right? So that's sort of the first difference. The second difference is also the speed at which media is reporting and discussing uh, stories has in intensified, right? So it's not this 24-hour news cycle where every morning there is fresh news, but um, the progression of stories today is much more rapid. Right? And the other, the other sort of important thing is that the information today reaches us in small increments from uh, real-time sources through social networks. And in some sense, think of Twitter, right? On Twitter, um, there are mainstream media houses, have Twitter outlets, and every person has a Twitter account, right? So the question that, that I'd like to ask and sort of try to, try to uh, poke during this talk is, how should sort of this, this new picture of uh, online media, how should this change our understanding of information consumption and the role the social networks play um, in, in, this, in this whole thing? So, um, Right, if I elaborate on this, right, so today we have b small bits of information that are continuous, continuously arriving to us through real-time sources and con conveyed to us by networks, right? And there are sort of two things that I think we need to um, reconcile or, or reason about, right? So the first thing is we need new ways to think about how information is being consumed, right? So how does it spread? What kind of methods can we develop to, to be able to, to track as information spreads through networks? And also um, how stories are assembled from uh, small little pieces. And then the second thing is um, the sort of the real-time aspect, right? Is um, how, do we, how do we analyze the real-time flow of information through networks, right? And sort of, again, the question is how do these fragments of information travel to the system and potentially mutate? Um, so the plan for the talk uh, today is the following. So what I want to talk about is basically I want to analyze mechanisms of the real-time spread of information through online media uh, and online social networks. And the questions that I'll try to answer uh, in this talk are, are the following, right? So the first thing is how can I even start thinking about how do I track messages, information, that, 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 that spreads, right? So that's the first thing. If I want to do anything, I need to be able to quantify and say, aha, this is a little marker that now I can track as it's spreading through something, right? Then what the second thing I'll start doing is I'll show you a simple model that will start, that will start trying to ask, answer the question is, can I sort of predict and quantify how, how information will spread and maybe how popular a particular piece of information will be two hours from, from now or one hour from now. And the last thing will be that I'll talk about is many times networks over which, let's say, information propagates are unknown or implicit. So the question is, how can we infer them? And what kind of, um, what kind of knowledge can we then get from those networks that we infer? Okay. So uh, that's the plan. So um, let, me, let me sort of um, start at the beginning, right? So if, if I want to tell you how to do this, the first thing is I need good data. So 
because everything is online, right? Today, in principle, we can collect nearly all online social media content, right? And what we've been doing since uh, August 2008 is um, collecting sort of this data at a rate of around um, 50 gigabytes a day, right? So we are getting, I think, uh, I was just checking this morning, around 40 million articles uh, were crawled yesterday, right? And basically what we are getting is everything that Google News is getting or everything Google News has, which is about 20,000 um, mainstream media sources. And then we have um, also crawling millions of blogs uh, and millions of forums, right? So sort of we are getting lots of text um, for every day since uh, August 2008, right? And if you would want to do something cool with this kind of uh, big data, right? So sort of this is like, I think now it's around 10 terabytes compressed. So it's, it's something, right? Um, so the question is, um, if I want to analyze this data, what kind of basic units of information um, could I sort of track so that I can start talking about how information spreads, right? So basically what is my first goal for, for the talk is I want to identify pieces of information that propagate, let's say, um, between nodes. And nodes, let's consider, let's think of them as websites or media sites, right? And um, these pieces of information um, could be many different things, right? So one option would be something that I will refer to as phrases. Another thing could be quotes, messages, maybe links. Is links, hyperlinks is something that is propagating through network. If you are on Twitter, it's something that is called hashtags, which are basically tags that are, that are, that, that tag every, um, that tag every tweet and so on. Right, so the question is, how do, how do I operationalize this? Um, and if I want to do this, the question is, what would I like, right? And sort of here are, I think, three things that we would like from these units that we will be then tracking and trying to quantify how uh, information spreads. So the first thing we would like is that these units that we will be tracking really com sort of correspond to some pieces of information, right? We would like them to be useful. Another thing that we would like is, we would like them to be, um, to vary at, uh, at an order of days, right? So what I mean by that is, for example, some kind of more global topic models won't be appropriate for this, right? Because sort of they are too bulky, they change too slowly, right? And the other thing is, these little things that I would like to track, I would, they need to be simple because I would like to do, to do this on a terabyte scale. And today I'll show you sort of two approaches how to do this. So the first thing to, to, uh, to do is about uh, tracking um, cascading hyperlinks. So basically how articles link, link to one another and because we know their timestamps, we can infer how information flowed. I'll show you an example uh, on the next slide. And the, the second thing I'll be talking about and sort of this will be the data that then we'll be using uh, mostly throughout the rest of the talk will be this idea of uh, meme tracking. So basically somehow identifying short, almost like genetic signatures of stories that travel intact um, through the web. Okay, so uh, first idea. What do I mean by cascading links to individual articles, right? So the idea is the following. If there is some small blog post, some obscure technological story, right? If this, if this thing propagates through some kind of underlying network, the idea is that other bloggers, let's, let, let that be our example, will pick it up, right? So the idea is that then some, let's say, small technological blog, my, my blue circle here, would create a hyperlink to the, to the red node and say, hey, there is this interesting story, I found it there. Right, and if this process would continue, then maybe some more prominent media sites, maybe some more some uh, technologically oriented professional blogs like Engadget and Slash that would pick this up, and again they would cite the source where they found this. Right, and then you would you could imagine if everything goes well, that then sort of this would further percolate to uh, to the mainstream media, like maybe to New York Times and BBC, and you know then people would cite the articles they read and so on. Right, so if I collect this data, I identify hyperlinks. I have this condition that um, uh, the source can only th sort of cite things that happened in the past. I trace hyperlinks in the di reverse direction that they point to. Um, then I get this, what we will call information cascades, right? I get these little graphs of how information spread. And the first thing I can do is, for example, I can go and enumerate and count uh, these graphs, right? So I can sort of do um, uh, graph counting. Uh, to some extent, right? And if I look at how do these cascades, these uh, uh, little graphs of how information flows look like, um, here are a few pictures, right? So what I'm showing you here, I'm sorting, I'm sorting these graphs that I that I enumerated. So um, the cascades, I showed you a, uh, an example of this on the previous slide, in the decreasing frequency, right? And sort of what are what are interesting observations, right? So first of, first interesting observation is that. Um, of course, smaller sort of in general things on less nodes are more frequent than things on more nodes, right? Sort of small cascades are more frequent than big ones. Okay, that's not a surprise. What is interesting is that you see these things are very shallow, right? They sort of have this kind of um, um, star structure, right? So, so what this means is basically every node in this every node on these graphs is a is a blog post and um, a, 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 a link, an edge, 
back to the edge here means that a post at the, at the bottom tends to link the post on the top in some sense, right? And another interesting thing that comes from here is that um, many sort of different uh, structures have, have, different, uh, have different frequencies. For example, this huge star is more, is more frequent than this little sort of triangle or fit forward loop, right? So um, there, is, there is very interesting um, relationship between the frequency of the graph and, and, it, and its structure, right? And it's not sort of just big things occur less than, than small things, but it's also about um, how, how, deep they, how deep they propagate and what kind of citation patterns they create in some sense. Right? So this is, for example, one way how you can use hyperlinks to, tra to track information flow. Uh, this is really good because it gives you an exact way to track the information and you know where, through which nodes it's spread. What the, problem, the problem is that people don't like to use hyperlinks or they don't cite their sources. So um, the, the next approach will be very different. Right? So the next approach we'll look at is something that, that, um, um, that we developed um, a, uh, two years ago and we refer it to meme track. Right? And the idea is that we basically want to identify textual fragments, little, let's say, sequences of words that travel relatively unchanged through many news articles. Right? And a, um, on a sort of one simple idea how to operationalize this is to say, OK, I will go and for every document extract stuff that appears in quotation marks. OK? So I get a document and I just go and extract whatever is in quotation marks, right? And the first question is, okay, do you get enough of these quotes in documents for this to be interesting at all? And actually, it turns out that you get. You get about more than one quote, so 1.25 quotes per document in our data. And what I mean by our data is uh, blog posts and uh, mainstream media articles, right? And um, what is good about um, Quotes is that actually they are they are very nice in some sense genetic signatures, right? It's they are better than keywords or named entities because it's really clear who was the person who said who made who said that piece of text. It's very clear at what occasion, at what time, and at what place, right? So I can really pinpoint what event or what caused or what was the occasion that that statement was was made, right? So it's easier to reason about it and sort of think about, aha, uh -huh, now I get a spike in the, in the number of mentions of Obama and let me figure out what's going on, right? So uh, that's the idea. One challenge uh, with extracting quotes is that they change a lot, right? So sort of they mutate. So what I'm showing you here is a very small subpart of a, what we call a quote inclusion graph, right? So every note here is a quote. You, you, can, you can read it. It's from 2008 US presidential election. And um, the, the arrows uh, mean approximate inclusion relationships, right? So you can see that sort of shorter pieces of, of uh, words are sort of included to some approximation in the longer quotes and these sort of quotes um, further, further mutate and you know there, there at the bottom of this graph would be the original mother quote from which all these short pieces have been derived and um, sometimes the tense change, changes and people um, uh, mis, uh, mistype them and so on. So the first challenge that we have is how do we identify mutational variants of quotes, right? So how do we cluster um, these quotes into something that says, aha, this, these are all the mutational variants of one quote, okay? So our goal is I want to find mutational variants of a quote. And um, here I have a picture that sort of will explain how one can do, it, do this, right? So um, every note here is a quote. Um, every letter is a word. Um, and the first thing what I will do is I will create a quote, sort of a pro approximate quote inclusion graph, right? So I will create a graph where I will take every short quote and create an edge to every longer quote where the short quote is approximately included in the long quote. So imagine that I'm basically doing um, a substring edit distance of one. So I say I have to be included in my parent and I can mutate a bit. I can maybe forget a word or have an additional word or I can swap a word, right? And uh, that would be the case, right? And the other thing I can do, I can put weights on these edges, right? I can say I'm, I think I'm, me as a quote, I'm more likely to have descended from that parent than this other possible parent, right? And this will create, because I'm only taking short quotes to be included in the longer ones, this will create me a directed acyclic graph, right? And what would I like to do? I would basically like to identify clusters or somehow partition this graph. And particular um, objective function that, that um, we decided to do is basically I would like to delete the minimal total number, ed uh, the total, total edge weight, such that each component has a single sink. Right, so um, I'll explain what, uh, what, what intuition um, is behind this. Let me just show you what would be the solution in this case. Solution in this particular toy example would be to, to delete this, um, uh, this red edges. That would be the, my clustering, right? So basically the idea is that I want to somehow have this 
um, mutational variants where for every, for every node, I know who is the grand grandparent, right? So for every component, I want to know, uh -huh, we all have descendant from this Adam and Eve type, type of quote, right? So that's sort of the, the intuition. If, and if every component here is, has, has a sing, uh, single sink, this means it, it has a single grand 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 parents from everything, uh, from which in some sense everything uh, got descended, right? And if you do this on our data, we basically, um, we took all the quotes that have at least four words and that appeared at least 10 times. This gives me 22 million quotes. And then, not surprisingly, this kind of deck partitioning uh, turns out to be MP hard, but there are some very cute heuristics that are sort of, in some sense, greedy top-down um, uh, procedures that at the end would give me 35,000 non-trivial clusters. So what I mean non-trivial, it means clusters with at least two quotes in them. Okay, so the first thing I can do now is I have these mutational variants. I grouped all the quotes uh, together and I can start seeing what does my data tell me. And um, here's the first thing I can do, right? So um, what I'm showing you here, x axis is time and y axis is volume. So volume means number of mentions per hour, right? And uh, this, now, this picture is now a bit old. So this is from 2008 presidential election. But if you remember what sort of was, what was going on there, um, then this actually makes a lot of sense, right? So let me sort of um, zoom in a bit and tell you a few stories what you see, right? Sort of that's the, that's the interesting part, right? And there is this um, quote about lipstick on a pig. So this was the statement that if you put lipstick on a pig, a pig is still a pig. And um, it was between Obama and uh, Sarah Palin. Um, then the other thing was sort of uh, realization that fundamentals of US economy um, are very strong, but uh, three days or four days later, a week later, there was a realization that the entire economy is in danger. And for example, what you can find here is all these statements or in somehow attacks Republicans were trying to make on Obama, right? So this is that he's spelling around with terrorists. Then they were asking who is the real Barack Obama. This was about Joe Biden, whether um, they can call him just Joe. Um, and none of these things sort of sticked or created a spike like lipstick on a pig created it, right? And for example, um, this last spike is the, the last televised um, uh, uh, presidential debate. The election was, was sort of here. And there were two things that sort of the main points from that debate. One was the statement from Obama that the wealth should be spread around, right? Sort of well, um, uh, spreading the wealth around. And the other one was sort of the statement from McCain that if Obama would want to run against, uh, uh, against Bush, then he should do this uh, four years ago, right? Um, and another thing that's interesting here is if you look at the total volume, so the total number of, let's say, quotes that are being produced per time unit um, through our data, that's pretty much constant over time. So what is interesting also here uh, from the modeling perspective is that the amount of stuff that is being, let's say, said or generated by the web is basically constant over time, right? Modulo, weekly, and daily periodicities. But uh, what you see here is that there sort of, there seem to be the synchronization events where um, lar large fraction of sites talk about some, something together, right? Which could be lipstick on a pig, and then, you know, economy, um, and then sort of they diverge. And again, everyone goes talk, talk about something, uh, something uh, of their own, and then again, another spike would, would arise, right? So here's an interesting modeling question of how can you make this some kind of um, synchronization? It seems almost like if you, if you think about how we clap in rooms, right? When one person starts clapping and then everyone starts to clap. So it seems something like that is going on with the, with the media. Um, another interesting thing that you can do is actually you can start quantifying you know, the interaction between bl blogs and mainstream media. And one option, so what we did here is basically we would label every site as a blog or as a mainstream media. And we just said, if the site appears on Google News, then we'll call it mainstream media. Otherwise, we'll refer to it as a blog. And one thing that you can quickly ask, uh, ask and answer is, um, you know, this sort of endless debate are blogs um, sort of ahead of the mainstream media, or are they trailing the mainstream media? And what uh, what uh, what you can measure from from the graph I'm showing you is actually that on the average, blogs tend to tend to trail mainstream media with 2.5 hour lag, right? So when when um, a particular quote reaches a peak popularity in mainstream media, it will take 2.5 hours later for that quote to reach, um, to reach uh, its peak popularity, peak number of mentions uh, on the blogs. However, uh, the whole picture is much more interesting if you start looking at it. So what I'm showing you here, I hope you can, you can read this, is basically for every website, for every media site, I'm showing, I'm showing you what is their average lag 
um, uh, relative to the peak popularity of the particular quote. And what you see from here is that basically p uh, sites that, that tend to precede the peak popularity of, of, a, of, uh, of a set of quotes are actually all professional blogs in this example, right? And then, um, so that's why their, their legs are negative, right? And uh, here, what I'm showing you is sort of mainstream media sites and their legs are still negative, right? And basically what this, what this tells you and what you can also see from the data is that there is this interesting handoff between blogs, mainstream media, and back to blogs. So it basically seems that it's early bloggers, early professional bloggers who are the first to pick up information, then it's the mainstream media guys who come uh, with a several hour leg, and then that sort of feeds back to the rest of the blogosphere, sort of the non-professional, personal part of the blogosphere that then reacts to the information they read on CNN or New York Times and so on. So that really seems what's, uh, what is going on and why um, blogs tend to trail. Blogs, for example, what you see from here, um, as mainstream media news is, ve uh, mainstream media is very quick at taking up things and stop, stop, stop talking about them, blogs sort of have much slower decays. So, decay. so they seem to be more like um, echo chambers in some sense. Okay, so that is sort of types of analysis or types of results um, that you can get by just looking at, um, at quoted phrases and quantifying this relationship between news um, and blogs. Um, another thing I'd like to start, uh, start asking now is, um, what are sort of patterns of information attention? So that's, that's what, I'll, what I'll talk about. And um, I, what I would like to understand is what are the typical shapes of these curves, right? So how, how does information become popular and how does, it, how, does it, how does it popularity, number of mentions decay over time? And here I will um, just introduce a bit of notation and vocabulary, right? So I will call item, I will use a letter I for it. I will just use, I will use it for, I will use this to refer to a piece of information. So in what we've seen so far, that could be, uh, that could refer to a quote. If I'm talking about, uh, let's say, Twitter network, uh, item can refer to a number, uh, to a URL or a hashtag on Twitter. And then volume of an item is just means how, how many times was this, was this, piece, this quote, mentioned during particular time interval t, right? And volume is just number of mentions. In some sense, you can think about this as attention the item got on the web or the popularity uh, of, that, of that item, right? And the first thing I could like, I, what I would like to do is basically to ask is what are the typical classes of shapes of this volume time series X, right? So for every, for every item, I know how, it, um, how its popularity changed over time. And I would like to say, what are the classes or types, clusters of these shapes, right? So what I will do is basically, I'm given a set of this time series of volume of different items, different quotes over time, right? Basically number of mentions of a quote over time for every quote. And I would like to discover what types of shapes do this volume time series obey, right? So in my little example here, sort of I have um, the, the x axis here is time, y is y, y axis is number of mentions, and sort of I have this toy example, and what I would like to discover here is to say, aha, uh -huh, there are two types of shapes. There is this sort of shape that has two peaks, and there is sort of this shape that has one peak, right? So that would be, um, that would be what I would like to discover. And what it turns out, so sort of if I go and use naive k-means um, algorithm to do this clustering problem in some sense, it won't be even able to find clusters here. So uh, why is that? Because there are sort of a few, um, a few special, um, special considerations that I need to consider, and this is what I'll tell you about now, right? So my goal is I want to basically cluster this time series, and I want to find cluster centers, right? I would like to say these are typical uh, shapes of uh, how information gets popular online. Right, um, right. So if I want to do this, I need to define a distance metric, and, and our distance metric here has sort of two. Um, uh, we have two two considerations that 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 or two properties that we'd like our time series metric to have. So the first thing is we'd like it to be invariant to scaling, right? So if I have two time series and I just multiply one with a with a constant. Um, then, um, then that should be that that should be a distance zero, right? So I want invariance to total volume of of an of an item, right? So in this example, the 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 distance between these two time series that I have here should be zero because one is just a scaled version of another. And the other um, consideration or the other constraint is also very natural. The idea is I want also invariance to translation, right? So if I have one quote. Uh, being very popular uh, two months ago and one being very popular today, the, the distance between these time series again should be zero, right? So I should be able to translate, shift the, 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 time, the, the time series on the x-axis uh, 
uh, and everything should be good, right? So basically, what is my distance metric? So given two time series x and y, what are the distance between, between them is this minimum between a and q, where q is the translation, right? Sort of it shifts the, y, the time series y left and right, and a is the scaling factor, right? And I would, the distance is sort of the solution to that, to that equation. And what is interesting is that the, if I use, now I want to do clustering, if I use ordinary k-means, it won't work because this is a non-Euclidean distance metric, so I won't be able to find the real cluster center, but it turns out if you construct a funny matrix and find the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue of that matrix, um, then you can solve this problem. We call the algorithm the k-spectral clustering algorithm, and um, instead of sort of telling you more about how it works, let me show you some cooler results, okay? So the first thing you notice is that there seem to be six different shapes of these clusters. So if you, it, it's not five, it doesn't seem to be seven, it seems to be six. Six. So that's sort of the first thing. And if you look at them, here I'm showing you cluster centroids for this uh, time series, right? So what do I have? I have sort of three different single spikes. I have a big spike and a small, small spike, a small spike and a big spike, and something sort of that, that is, uh, has a single spike and then lots of small spikes. So something that sort of is popular for a very long time. And time here is in hours, and because our distance metric is invariant to translation, it doesn't really m matter what the absolute values are here and what the absolute values are on the Y scale. Um, what is also interesting, so the, the, the data that I used to create this thing was one year of quotes data over um, a subset of 172 million documents and uh, 300 fi nearly 350 million quotes. Um, another uh, analysis that we did was using uh, Twitter data, where it's about uh, 600 million tweets and also 8 million uh, hashtags. And if you do the, and if you now measure the popularity of a hashtag over time, what is interesting that you find exactly the same clusters. So they, the correspondence is one to one, which sort of leads us to believe that our results are somewhat robust. Another interesting thing that is shown on this plot is the following, right? So what I'm, what I did here is um, also we labeled. Um, different websites, but white, what type of media they are, right? Sort of, is this a newspaper? Is that a professional blog, a TV station, news agency, like Reuters and Associated Press, or is it just a normal blog, right? And what I'm um, showing here is, um, what is the median time that, that media of that particular type Tends to, tends to mention phrases that, that have a particular pattern of popularity over time, right? So what this says is that when, when a phrase has this kind of uh, symmetric single peak popularity, all the media types seems, seem to mention this thing at about the same time. But then, for example, for some, for some other cases, um, they, um, they are, they are uh, the media types, types sort of cluster in a characteristic way. So let me uh, point out two examples. So here is, uh, here's the first, the first example is this sort of very asymmetric peak where I get very quick, uh, increase in popularity and then in some sense, um, still quick, but slower uh, decay of that popularity. And if I see when do different websites mention this kind of phrases, it's actually news agencies that, that are the first to mention, to mention quotes that exhibit this kind of popularity curve, curves and, uh, blocks come the last here. So, um, which is interesting because, for example, in this case, blogs tend to mention these phrases with 1.3 hour lag, and they only account for about 30% of volume of total number of mentions for phrases that have this kind of pattern. Here's a different pattern where phrases become popular much longer, right? So here what we see is actually bloggers who are the first of these media types to mention, to mention the phrases, and actually they tend to be, in this particular case, about 20 minutes um, uh, they tend to mention 20 minutes before the, the mainstream media uh, guys come, and also they, can, they tend to account for about 53% um, of these phrases, uh, of the volume of the phrases. And sort of what is the point that I'm trying to make here? It seems, and if you also, if you go look at other shapes, is that depending on when do different media types come into the, let's say, into a discourse or discussion, when they join, the popularity will have a characteristic shape. So that's basically the, 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 bo the bottom line that I try to communicate here, right? So basically it seems that different types of media give rise to a particular characteristic shape of uh, popularity pattern of that item over time, okay? And this now will nicely lead to the next, uh, sort of the next thing I want to do. 
So the next thing I want to do is uh, I want to have a model that will be able to, to some sense, predict how much attention will information get, how many mentions will information get in the future, right? So what I have here is it's basically, in some sense, a classical time series prediction problem. I have time, I have number of mentions, I see how this number of mentions changes over time, and now I'd like to say how, how often will this be mentioned um, in the next time step or in the future. And the way how, how this has traditionally been thought of is to say, uh-huh, I have a network, um, over this network, there is some information spreading. Information can spread between uh, the nodes connected uh, in this network. So the idea would be if A is the first one to mention this, then A spreads information to, B, to C and B and E and so on, right? So and this way, if I would be able to model this process, then I can just uh, say how many nodes were infected at each uh, time interval, and that would be my uh, that would be my prediction. Uh, the the issue here, of course, is that the network that that we that we have, or actually that we don't have is unknown and um, that sometimes information will actually jump in the network, right? So if there is some kind of external uh, influence going on to the network, then information won't just sort of continuously spread, but it may actually jump. So how to get back to this problem uh, is the following, right? So basically what I would like to do is I would like to predict the future number of mentions uh, based on which nodes got infected in the past. So um, let me elaborate on this. Okay, so here is, we still want to do this prediction. So how I can think about this? I can ask, uh -huh, who, let's say, typically reports information and when, right? So if I now track a particular quote and I ask which websites mention it at a particular point in time, I, for example, can say that, for example, um, early in the first hour, it would be professional bloggers who mentioned this. And then, you know, in the se second hour, it would be news agencies. And then, you know, uh, one hour later, it would be mainstream media sites. And, you know, at hour number four, it would be some other sites that would mention this and so on. So that's how I will be thinking about it. So basically what I will try to say is I would like to predict how many sites will mention the, 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 a particular phrase at hour number four based on what were the identities of the sites that mentioned this uh, in the past. Right. So one way how to get to this uh, to this problem is to ask the following question. Right. Is to say, aha, uh -huh, if New York Times mentions a particular quote at some time t, how many additional mentions this sort of does this generate? And here I mean generate not in a, a causal way, but in a correlation type of way on other sites at time t plus one, t plus two, and so on. Right. So um, basically, what I will what I will assume is the following. I will say that every, every media site, you, I will assign it what I will call an influence function, right? And the way I will, I will think about this influence function, I have it in quotation marks because, again, this is not that I really want to quantify causal influence, I just want to quantify correlation. And what I want to say is that basically this influence function, we quantify the following thing. It will say, aha, uh -huh, after my, my website, you, my New York Times mentions a piece of information, how many other websites tend to mention that same piece of information Q hours later, right? And Q is this time that, that goes on, right? And maybe I could say, aha, uh -huh, these influence functions would have a shape like this, right? So this would say, aha, uh -huh, at hour zero, when, when uh, site U mentions this, this is how many additional mentions is generated. One hour later, people see this and they are able to react to it and, you know, it has even bigger impact. And then when the information gets stale or old, the number of mentions of that thing sort of decreases um, or decays with time, right? So the idea is basically one way to understand this is to say, okay, what would be the influence function of CNN? You could think of it at least intuitively to say how many sites say the information after CNN uh, say, says it, right? And the idea will be that we will want to, e to estimate these influence functions uh, from, the, from the historical data so that we are then able to make predictions. How do we make predictions, right? So how do we predict the future volume of a, of a particular piece of information? We say um, we use the influence functions of the nodes that mentioned this information in the past, right? So we use identities of the nodes that mentioned this in the past. So um, we call this linear influence model, and let me sort of give you a pictorial example how this works, and I think it will be very intuitive, right? So what I have, I have a single, let's say, single, single item that I want to predict um, its volume, number of mentions over time. Um, I have this, uh, I will call this set A that is indexed by time, that is a set of nodes that mention this uh, information at a particular point in time, or up to that particular point in time. Um, and um, what I would like to do is, so I have time, I have volume, I have this time series, I'd like to predict the value of this time series in some future time. I know, because I have this set A, I know what are the identities of websites when they, let's say I have three websites, U, V, and W, when they mentioned this particular thing. 
what I, what I also have is I have an influence function for every website. Imagine that Node U has this kind of shape and V has that kind of shape and uh, W the, the other kind of shape. So my, um, my prediction for the future volume of the item will be just um, um, the sum of influences at a, at the, um, of influence functions aligned so that every, every, every website's influence function starts when they mention the phrase, and then I just sort of sum their contributions, and that's my prediction, right? So um, that's how the model will work, right? And here I just put it in equations. So I'm basically saying, aha, uh -huh, my estimate of the number of mentions of an item in the next time step is I go over all the, all the, all the websites that mentioned this item in the past, and I sum up their influences where um, uh, this is the time when the website first mentioned the thing, right? So this is this time and this is current time so that I appropriately align this influence functions. The question of course is how do I go um, and uh, figure out how these influence functions, what is their shape, okay? So um, basically if I, if I elaborate this about this a bit more, right? So the intuition is that um, the influence function sort of captures the contribution to the total volume of a phrase of a particular website over time. So it means after a website said it, how, 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 um, how much is the contribution of that website over time, right? I cannot observe this influence function, so I have to estimate them from the data. Um, and um, the way I will think about this is I will make no assumption about the shape of these functions, so I will make no parametric assumption. I will just model them as vectors of, let's say, 24 numbers, right? So what will this say is uh, influence functions are sets of 24 numbers, sort of after a day, their value goes to zero. And at the end, what I would like to solve is I would like to solve this kind of least squares-like problem, right? So I go over all, I, I go over all, my, all, my, all my time series, I go over all times, this is the volume of the time series in the future, that's my prediction, right? It says all the websites that mentioned this particular uh, item I, this is uh, their influence at, at uh, appropriate time, sum this up, that is my prediction, I want my prediction error to be minimized, I take a, um, I take a square of that, sort of I do the L2 norm, and this is basically a least squares-like problem, right? So there is lots of machinery that allows me to solve very efficiently. Um, so very simple, right? And these are just values. These are just coefficients because these functions i are just um, are just vectors, right? Sort of sets of numbers. So it's very easy to solve this, um, in, and you can do it in a very scalable way. So let me tell you how well this works. So here is an example of what we will be doing. So imagine. So the setting here is the following. I would like to predict the number of mentions of a particular quote in the future. I have this universe of um, uh, 370,000 um, uh, mentions of uh, 1,000 quotes across uh, 16,000 websites, right? So my universe is 60,000 websites. I have 1,000 quotes that uh, get mentioned by, by these 60,000 websites, and I will select a subset of 100 of them for which I know at which time they mentioned each of these 1,000 quotes, right? So in some sense, I get to observe what is that 100 websites talk about, and I would like to make a prediction, what is the 16,000 websites, what do they talk about, right? So I'm, I'm observing what 100 of them do, so I estimate influence functions of only 100 of them, and I want to make predictions about what is the whole population doing, right? Um, if I do that, what I'll be showing you is um, improvements in um, a, a sort of a simple, but uh, given that we had very fine time scale, a very good sort of relatively good predictor, which is this predict its one time lag predictor, and I'm comparing results to sort of stan standard time series uh, regression models, right? And sort of the point is that when, when uh, phrases, the popularity is very bursty, sort of the, 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 the popularity changes very quickly, our method works a factor of two or three better than standard time series regression, and if when uh, phrases, their popularity change, changes slower, we sort of do comparably well. But most of the phrases on the web have very sort of short lifetime. They, they, they get born and they die in basically 24 hours. So that's sort of the first thing, is that this seems to be to give relatively good predictions. You only need to monitor 100 websites and you can predict, sort of, in some sense, predict well what the whole universe, in this case of 16,000 uh, sites, is doing. Another interesting thing is that you can actually look at the, these estimated influence functions. So what you can do is the following. You can say, aha, uh -huh, 
what, what do these influence functions tell me, right? So you could say, aha, uh -huh, when New York Times writes a post, let's say, on politics, how many people tend to mention this, um, this, these quotes that appear in this, uh, in this article next day, right? And this is sort of what, what the, these influence functions try to, try to quantify uh, of New York Times for political phrases. So what I'll do now is I will have five different media types, newspapers, professional blogs, TV stations, um, news agencies, and blogs. I will have six topics, uh, basically politics, nation, entertainment, and so on. And for, uh, for each, for a set of phrases that belong to a particular topic, I will estimate an influence function for each, um, for each sort of media type separately. And now I will plot these functions in the next slide. So right, what I'm showing here is uh, two types, two topics. One is politics, one is entertainment, and for the five types of media that I'm interested in, I'm showing you these influence functions over time, right? So the way you can understand this is, for example, red would be news agencies, and it says when uh, news agencies mention a particular quote, in the next hour, uh, on average, 60 other websites tend to mention, in our data set, right, tend, tend to mention this. And what is interesting here, I'm comparing blue versus red, news agencies versus professional blogs, and for example, you can see that for politics, it's news, news agencies that are very influential at the beginning, but then actually uh, blogs start to kick in, and that's even more, uh, more, um, more um, apparent for, for example, entertainment news, where blogs have this long, constant, su sustained, in some sense, influence um, over uh, what is being talked, while the decay of, um, of um, news agencies um, is, is much quicker. So this is just sort of a small anecdotal example of what kind of insights one can get from uh, fitting this model to the data. So um, be, now I'm sort of, we are now moving on, right? We saw how to track information. We saw what are these types of shapes of popularity. We saw how to uh, think about uh, making predictions, how popular information gets. What I would like to do now is actually, I would like to talk about how do I infer networks when networks are invisible to me? So um, the idea is the following, right? Imagine this is my universe of, of, uh, of the web, and I get to extract, let's say, quotes, and then these this quotes somehow spread through my network, right? Um, and imagine there is sort of this red piece of information that's spread in this particular way, and then there is some other blue piece of information, and all I get to see is the times when websites mention the particular piece of information, right? And what I would really like to infer is how did this information travel? What is the underlying graph, the underlying skeleton over which this could have spread, right? So the idea is basically I only get to, to see times when sites mention information, but I don't get to see the edges of this underlying network. What I would like to do is I would like to reconstruct this network, right? So that's sort of, um, um, that's my goal. And uh, more broadly, there are many examples of the same question in different do domains, right? So for example, if I want to talk about uh, disease propagation, I can say, aha, uh -huh, I have viruses, diseases that pro propagate through social, uh, through networks, think about flu, right? I don't know what are the connections of the network. All I know is um, I get to observe when people get sick, basically when people go to the doctor, but I don't get to observe who infected whom. My goal is, can I infer the network? Or another application that we actually worked on is um, if you, is word of, mar word of mouth or um, viral marketing type question, where uh, the question is, I have recommendations and people make product recommendations to one another. These recommendations influence purchases. Again, all I get to see is times when people make purchases, but not who made the recommendation to whom. The question is, can I infer what is the underlying social network over which recommendations spread? Um, and so these are just different coins of the same question. So how we will go about um, trying to answer this question um, here, is, here is pictorially what, uh, what, what I'm really trying to do, right? I'm assuming there is some network um, over which something will spread, let's say a disease or a piece of information, and all I will get to see is when nodes get infected, right? So there is the network, I don't see the network, um, I have something spreading over it, let's say this yellow color, yellow color spreads through the network, and all I get to see is infection times, right? So basically, for the yellow infection, this is node identity and the time when node got infected. And maybe there is now my blue um, piece of information that spreads, again, through the edges of this network in some other way, and again, all I get to observe is um, the, the, in the identities and the times when nodes got infected. What I would like to do is I would like to infer and say, aha, uh -huh, this is the network over which um, the information really spread. 
So um, how do I go about uh, form formulating this? So this is basically what I'll do. Um, I, will, I will pose this as a maximum likelihood problem, right? So basically what I will do is I will define a model how I believe information spreads through the graph, and then I will define the likelihood that will say how likely is my graph to, um, to explain my observed data, right? So in some sense, I have this score that says how good is the graph to explain the infection times that I see. And, um, whoops, sorry. And my, um, my goal will be to find the graph that maximizes this score, this um, objective function, this likelihood, right? So um, let me tell you why this may be hard, right? So my goal is find the graph that best explains the infection times. So the first, there are sort of two problems. First problem is how do I efficiently compute um, this particular score, this um, likelihood. Even so, basically, even if you give me a single graph, how do I quickly evaluate and compute how good is this graph uh, with respect to my data? So that's sort of the first non-trivial question. And the second one that's even, that's even worse is, right, even if I'm able to evaluate a single graph, now I would like to find an optimal graph, right? So in, in principle, if I would be naive, I would need to go and search over all possible graphs, compute a score for each one of them, pick the best one and say, hey, here is my solution, right? The problem is that the number of graphs is kind of big, right? So if you ask how many adjacency matrices are there, there is two to the n squared, let's say, in some sense, um, um, is isomorphic, if you sort of forget about isomorphism, different adjacency matrices. What I'll show you is an algorithm that can sort of solve this problem in uh, quadratic time, so in polynomial time, uh, with an approximation guarantee. So it will be something, we will be so solving the problem approximately, but much faster than what naive solution would do, right? Um, and we, can, we will be able to do this for networks of tens of thousands of nodes uh, easily. Okay, so um, how, as I said, that's the plan, what I want to do. So the first thing I will do is define the model of how I believe information propagates, right? So the, all I need to specify is how does the information spread from one node to another? And the way I will define this process is something that is called independent, independent contagion model, right? So when node A gets infected, for each, of it, for each of the neighbors in the network, it will flip a coin and with uh, this coin will have bias beta, and with this probability beta, the information will be transmitted, and then we need to sort of sample what we will say, uh, what we will call an incubation time, right? So the idea will be no day gets infected at um, time A, and now we need to decide when B will get infected, and we sample some time delay um, from some arbitrary distribution we don't really care about. But just to think about it, basically the idea is the following, that um, the more, the more closely together two nodes got infected, the more likely there was an edge between them. That's basically the, 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 the basic intuition, is that if two nodes tend to get infected one after another relatively soon, then there is probably an edge between them. So that's, that's the intuition that we will be building on. Okay, so now I know how to say how likely was A to infect B. So I have this two-step process. First one is flip a coin, decided that um, information will transmit. And then the second part is uh, sample, decide what will be the delay, what will be the sort of incubation time in some sense, okay? So now um, imagine that I have this set of infection times C. So here is an example. And I have a particular pattern T in which information spreads. So here you would say, uh-huh, it spread from A to B, it spread from A to C, and then from B to E. So here's a, here's a little example. Um, that I will be giving you, and what I would like to now say is, uh -huh, given a particular pattern, T, in which the information spread, how likely am I to observe these infection times, right? And the way, the way this equation will work is very simple, right? I go over all the edges that transmitted information, I say, uh-huh, they have to transmit with probability beta, and this is the sort of the probability of observing that particular time delay on that edge, right? So these are all the edges that transmitted, and these are all the edges that did not transmit, they did not transmit with probability one minus beta. So here's an example. I have my graph. Re red edges are the edges over which I believe my, my contagion, my uh, information spread. So I say, aha, uh -huh, these are the edges that spread the information. My red edges are the edges that did not spread the information. So this is sort of the product. The, the second product is the product over red stuff. And the first product is the product over blue stuff. Right? So this is a way now, if you give me a graph, you give me a set of infection times, and you give me a particular way in which you believe information propagated, I can evaluate how likely was, um, what's the likelihood of that event, right? So how good is this pattern T? Right? So now we already know something. So if I give you a graph, you could go over 
in some sense, all possible spanning trees of this yellow subgraph and, um, and um, evaluate this for each one of them. And that would tell you how well does that graph explain the spread of uh, or explain a set of particular infection types. Um, what we will do is one approximation. Instead of considering all possible ways how information can spread, we will just say, let's consider only the most likely, the most likely way in which it spreads. So let's only consider the best three, the best pattern that explains how information spread. Right? So if I'm able, and I'm able to do that efficiently, so now I say, if I, has, if I have, um, 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 what I want to do is I want to say I want to go over all the ways the information spread over a given graph, and I will just take the best, the best one, the one that maximizes the log likelihood, so the log of my probability. And now, given that I have a set of infections or a set of different information spreading over, I, I will quantify what is the score of a graph given a set of, inf uh, a set of different pieces of information spreading is just the sum over um, the individual uh, cascade likelihoods, right? And what is my goal? My goal is to find the graph that maximizes this objective function, right? My goal is to find the graph that best explains my infection times over um, all different diseases that spread uh, through my network. Um, again, not surprisingly, this is MP-hard, can be a sort of reductionist uh, through the max k cover, uh, but there is a very cute algorithm that can solve this thing um, in, in uh, relative, uh, quickly in, and uh, with an approximation guarantee. So uh, what's the algorithm? We call the algorithm netint, and it's very simple. So basically what it does, it's, it uses greedy hill climbing to maximize this uh, objective function. So the idea is that we will start with an empty graph, so a graph where, that has no edges, just isolated nodes, right? And then we will be throwing in edges one by one. So, um, and imagine that also somebody tells us how many edges will be in our graph. And this is basically a parameter. So the way we'll do is we'll have just a for loop that goes from one to k. Um, in every step, we will add additional edge to the graph and we will be greedy. So at every step, we will add an edge to our graph that maximizes the marginal improvement in our log likelihood or in our objective function, right? So the idea is I have some current, current graph. I'm I'm for now I'm check I'm trying to find the edge that best that gives me the most improvement over my current score right so at every step I try all the edges that haven't that I haven't yet added there is a quadratic number of them with the number of nodes I find the one that gives me the most improvement over my um, objective score right now and I throw in uh, that edge to the graph right so so very basically a very simple algorithm and there are two benefits that come from it first is that this is very fast and simple the other thing is that you can prove that this algorithm will do well so what I mean by well is that it will give you this 63 percent um, approximation guarantee so basically if this the optimal solution would have score opt I will be at least at 63% of that optimal score, right? So I'm doing, I'm losing less than half by doing some, some sort of greedy thing over trying out all possible graphs. Um, to show you how well this works, let me, let me give you an example. So the idea, the setting here is the following. I have a graph on K edges. I will on, first show you results on synthetic data. So I will simulate how information spreads through the graph. I will record infection times, I will throw my graph away, and I will try to reconstruct it. Um, and what I will be showing you here is basically these precision recall curves, right? Precision recall over the edges that I, that I try to infer. And uh, my goal, the best thing is to be up here, right? That would mean I have precision one and recall one, and this is over the edges of my uh, reconstructed graph. And what turns out is that this method, at least on synthetic data, works amazingly well. Um, so this is now for two types of graphs. These are like uh, scale-free power law graphs, and this is um, Kronecker graphs, right? And it turns out that in order for you to be able to infer an edge, you need about two infections propagating over each particular edge, okay? So um, at least on synthetic data, this works uh, fast and amazingly well. So let me now show you some results on real data. So the results on real data that I will be showing you is basically about propagation of quotes, um, as I, as I, the same data as I had before, 172 million news articles and blog posts over one year period, uh, 340 million quotes. For every quote and every website, I uh, record time when uh, quote I was mentioned by website W. And now given the, the times when sites mention these things, I want to infer what is the, what is the uh, underlying network. So basically, how I could think about this is this is the network of who tends to copy after whom, or who tends to repeat quotes uh, 
uh, after whom, um, between media sites, right? And if I, if I plot the network, this is if I take the highest volume 5,000 sites, red is mainstream media sites, blue is blogs, um, looks intriguing and complicated, but sort of not more. But actually, if I zoom in, I get uh, to see interesting things. So same network, just a zoom in to a set of posts, and what I get to see here is the following. So the first thing I observe is that I get these topical clusters, right? So um, this first circle here, these are all uh, or mostly um, liberal, um, liberal political blogs, basically Huffington Post and things, things around, around that. Uh, the second cluster I observe is here. It's about entertainment, um, um, celebrity news, and so on. And then the cluster here at the bottom, it's um, about um, uh, gadgets, technology, and so on. And what is interesting, that sort of another thing that you can get from this graph is the position of nodes um, in this graph, right? So for example, I have Huffington Post here that's very embedded in the political class, how I call this, right? But then, for example, here is Guardian, the, the British newspaper, right? They are much more on the side, and actually they tend to talk about uh, gossip and also mention some technology, right? And similarly, I have uh, a site here called tech chuck that has connections to outside the cluster, but then I have Engadget here um, that's nicely embedded in the cluster, right? So sort of this kind of analysis give me insight about what kind of role do different um, sites play in the, in the diffusion of information online. Um, let me do sort of start to, uh, to wrap up. And um, the, if, if I start doing that, the sort of the next question, the last question that I will be asking is sort of if I think what we've done so far. We identified how to, how to track information. We identified um, um, how to predict its popularity. And now we also are able to identify networks over which information spreads. So the next thing I could like to do is sort of an application and say, OK, can I detect information outbreaks online? Or can I recommend you blogs to read so that you are most up to date? Right? So the idea is the following. Again, my, my story is spreading over the web. And um, what I would like to do, for example, if I would, um, I want to know stories before other people know them, right? So I want to know big news early, right? So one option would be if I would recommend you to read this particular blog down here, what would be good about it, right? It would be good because you would get to know about all three stories, the red one, blue one, and yellow one. But the problem would be you would get to know them very late. Right? But for example, right, so you would in some sense detect all information outbreaks, but you detect them late. Or I could recommend you that block up here. Um, what would be good is that you would be the first sort of early to know the two stories, but you would miss the red one. Right? And the question is, how can I, how can I formalize uh, this kind of problem? Right? And the way I can formalize it, I can think about it as some kind of set cover like problem. So the idea will be the following. Right? The idea will be that I will assume that I have the graph of the blogosphere. I will, you, I will be given some budget, let's say the number of blogs I want to recommend to, to a particular user. And the idea will be I want to select sites to cover most of the stories on the web, right? So to cover most of the nodes in this, of the network, right? So in some sense, I can think that every node here will have like a, uh, a set of sites that it covers or that, um, that it uh, uh, collects information from. So the idea is I want to uh, recommend a small set of sites to somehow cover this graph as well as possible. And again, as, every, as everything in real life, this is also MP-hard. But again, there is a cute and fast algorithm that can do this um, um, near optimally in real time. And just to give you an idea how, how this works, right? so the idea is, for example, here is real data. Every dot is a website. And now um, I'm recommending you different websites. So when I make a recommendation, I sort of color the nodes by which, by which site they, they, um, they, they are covered, right? So here I made, uh, I, the algorithm decided to select this block here, and now sort of the, um, everything that happens is sort of covered by that block, right? And then the second part, the, the algorithm decides to sort of monitor this cluster and select, uh, select, recommend a block from that cluster. And then here is number three, and now you see some, some sites here also changed color, and sort of in this, iterative um, sequential way, you are deciding to, to recommend blogs. And um, just to show you how well this works, here is an example. No, X-axis is number of blogs I recommend. Y-axis is fraction of stories that you detect. Higher is better. Um, if I would make recommendations at random, it's terrible. If I would do them by, let's say, the number of posts 
or the number of outlinks a block has. I'm not doing so well if I would do by the number of inlinks, sort of find influential bloggers by the number of inlinks. That also doesn't work so well. But if I use this set covering like idea, I can recommend a small number of blogs that capture most of the information flow through networks or detect that very efficiently. Um, and this has sort of interesting applications in terms of recommending what to read so that you are, in some sense, most up to date and know things early. So no big stories early. So to start wrapping up, right? So what I was trying to convey through this talk today is um, how to reason about messages that are arriving through networks from real time, real time sources and how to think about this. And sort of I showed um, different examples of this pipeline, right? So first I talked about how to track information that, uh, that flows through these networks, how to quantify dynamics and how to predict um, the popularity of this information. And then we looked at how to infer networks and how to now start doing some kind of detection or recommendations of blogs based on how information flows through these networks. Um, what are sort of interesting, interesting uh, future points is right sort of is that through this um, net, th through this framework or these sets of steps that I was talking about, we were able to quantify um, and track the, um, the information as it spread, spreads through networks, and quantify what is the dynamics of, let's say, social media, mainstream media, how is information being handed off between the two, and so on. Right? I think there are many different areas where sort of similar type of types of approaches can be used. One, as I was showing before, is in epidemiology, where now you, instead of tracking information, you are tracking um, diseases, or viral marketing, where you are tracking product purchases instead of um, little quotes. Um, and then, sort of, what are what are further questions or sort of some of the topics we are uh, uh, discuss, uh, trying to in, uh, reason about right now? Is basically can this kind of data and this kind of analysis help I, help us identify dynamics of polarization? Right? How does why, why does their polarization occur? How does, let's say, different, the, how does the same story, the same quote, how does the context in which it appears change as this flows through networks? Uh, you know, how does the sentiment ar around, around this change? So one is, how does the attitude and sentiment change? And the other one, how does also information change? So if there is a long quote, can I sort of predict which parts of the network will, will cite which different parts of this quote? So those are sort of some of the um, questions um, we, are, we are looking at currently. Um, all I would like to say at the end, if, if you are interested in some of these topics, we have this website called snap.stanford.edu, where basically we are giving or making lots of network data publicly available, network data sort of um, over time. All this uh, quote and meme data that I was talking about is also available here. So you can go play uh, with the data yourself. Um, so um, that concludes my talk. I'd be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, excellent works. And uh, I have a small question about uh, the evaluation of the, of the finding hidden structure of, of the influence. Uh -huh. uh, um, and you mentioned that um, your greedy hill climbing uh, algorithm can find uh, uh, about 63% uh, of op op optimization. Oh, let me be clear. So that is the worst case, right? So I'm saying if you give me the nastiest possible data, I, the, the worst I will do is be at 63%. What turns out is that there are other bounds that you can compute, and it turns out that at the, in reality, we are at 95% of the objective function. So the error that we are getting is about 5% in the objective function. So in what I showed you, the, the proof sort of is the worst case, over all possible inputs, what's, what's the worst you can do? Um, but then you can also ask, given an input, how well am I doing? And if you do that, you see you are at 95, not at 63. Um, uh, so yeah, but yeah, yeah. please. Uh, so this is a theoretical analyze. analysis. You uh, theoretical analyze the result. Exactly. The so case, yeah. what happens is, like what you show is that objective function is submodular, and then Greedy hill climbing on monotone submodular functions gives you this one minus one over e approximation guarantee. Oh. Um, so that's what it turns out. Uh, what sort of the other way we evaluated this was on trying to predict hyperlinks. So the idea was based on which sites mention what phrases can I predict um, uh, which site links to which one. 
and I have ground truth because I have hyperlinks that worked with um, break-even point of, I think, 0.7. Um, and the other application we had was um, recommendations. Actually, we had some data from an anonymous online retailer where we knew um, which people made product recommendations to which other people, and we knew whether those people purchased. So now, given a set of um, um, uh, times when people purchase products, can you infer what is the network over which recommendations spread? And that, that, that was even easier, so that, or that worked even better. I think the break-even point was like 0.8. So, uh, sort of high. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, excellent work. Um, I'm, uh, I mean, I have been, say, oh, you, you have been presenting us a lot of the what and the how. I mean, uh, it's just uh, how to do things, what, what is happening. Uh, I was, I was like reflecting on uh, whether you have done any work on the why. Why, why is this happening? Uh, just looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, are you doing any anthropological studies or something more related to the information sciences? People, why they do this, and are you trying to analyze that? Uh, um, excellent point. So what I haven't um, discussed so much is, so I was sort of talking about more, let's say, algorithmic and predictive modeling of these things. Uh, one other aspect that, that we do is um, sort of we don't do these ethnographic studies and go talk to people, but what we also have is this sort of physics-like models where you, know, you say, what is the basic set of ingredients that I need to have to reproduce some global phenomena? And then, for example, you can start reason how, what kind of distribution over interestingness of the story do I need and how should, um, how should, um, um, how should sort of copying behavior come into play to be able to reconstruct some of these global patterns. So we have, we have results of these things also. Thank you, Yuri. Excellent work. Uh, in the beginning, when you are trying to analyze the different patterns of the spread of information, you omitted the uh, content analysis. Later on, when you are uh, predicting the influence faction, you introduced the topics. What uh, observation did you... Uh -huh. So topics was very simple. Um, take the URL, check. So the way newspapers work is domain of the, the, the domain name slash sports. Um, entertainment. So that was my topic classification. So it was very simple. So no, no clustering, no, no LDA. Just look at URL, see if you know the thing after the domain name is says sports. And most of the websites are organized that way. And those were the labels we used. So in some sense, we used human labels to identify topics. Um, for the for the result for the results that I was showing you with um, with. Um, um, over, over, uh, overall, um, there we used just one one influence function for 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 a particular media site, regardless of the topic of the phrase. And of course, in the later example, what I showed you was for every topic, for every site, I trained a different influence function. So you can do this at different granularities um, the way you want it. Um. Absolutely fascinating. I was curious about your graph approximation technique. Uh, I get the impression that it discounts the incubation time because you look at immediately adjust, adjacent, but maybe the average uh, you do at the end counterbalances that. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you take you take you know if say there's A B C D, you seem to prefer C D over say A D. Uh, if there's a high incubation time, maybe AD is more likely. I see. So, oh, um, um, uh, good point. So the way it's sort of what I said in, in the algorithm, there, we make no assumption about how does the incubation time function look like. So how does the density look like? You can, it can be arbitrary. So there is, the algorithm makes no assumption. It can multiple, sort of, it can have multiple peaks. Doesn't really matter. So that's, that's for you as a domain expert to tell the algorithm how does this incubation time function look like. So it could be the most likely it's after three days, but then after 10 days, there's another spike. Uh, we can all handle that. What I thought that you were originally ans asking was, and of course, this, this, this uh, incubation time, it could uh, sort of this incubation time function, it could depend on identities of the sites, it could depend on the topic, it could de depend on what are the two different quotes on two sites, how much mutation was there, so you can make it arbitrarily complicated. But sort of the basic intuition is the farther away the infection time is, the less likely the information to propagate between the sites. So that's sort of the the basic intuition, then you can make things much more fancy, but, and it still goes through. 
Uh, thinking about using text, you did use quotes, mm -hmm. which is kind of, instead of just going for frequencies of words, you abstract it a little bit and just, you said quotes. So I keep thinking in that direction. You mentioned opinion. Uh, how, how do you think you can abstract a bit more into going into semantics and then observe some phenomena? So you can kind of abstract, oh, talking about that, it doesn't need to be quote. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't need to be exactly tracking what you did, but still the same approach would apply, right? The same kind of observing of changes over time. Mm -hmm. So that's one direction. And let me just ask the other one, which is, another thing is if I represent my text document as a graph, can you observe some changes and abstract it? You know, so kind of, you know, talking about, I don't know, that and that and changes over time. You know um, what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. uh, great points. So. Um, I, I agree, right? So what, what, I, what I showed is basically this simple idea, take stuff in quote, quotations, track that, right? And I think we really need to do more work to really understand what kind of biases this creates and so on. So if you want to go outside the quotes, um, so here is sort of a few ideas. One idea would be find stuff in quotes as seeds and then go outside. Another option would be have a, this is all non-semantic type answers, right? The other thing is um, use some kind of language model and try to find surprising sequences of words. Um, what is problematic there is that I love you, made in China, web 2.0, this stuff starts to come up. So it would be, I think it would be very nice if you could somehow abstract even further and try to consider synonyms and so on. The problem is how, how will you handle this on these hundreds of millions or billions of items or documents? But yeah, I mean, it would be very nice to be able to abstract even further. I agree. So, two questions. First, the notion of time. Um, how confident are you in the time points when stories got published? Because it's really hard for some media to decide when exactly they, they bro break it. The second question uh, is emergence of, of news. So, you start at the point where, where you observe, oh, this blog has uh, interesting news that no one else has, uh, frequently. What, mm -hmm. what happens at the beginning? Is it one blog that basically takes information from real world into the blogosphere? Or is it like all the blogs and they break one story per year and then there is this first one that you observe that actually aggregates from those blogs, not from real world? Um, uh, excellent, e really good question. So one thing that we are trying to, to do right now is really sort of develop methods that will tell us when did the event happen and when did it occur in the network, right? So in some sense, something outside, sort of if you think about Twitter, right? Something outside happens, you see it, you see it on Twitter. And then this, as it's sort of in the network, it also spreads through the network. So the question is, can I, based on how, how, how it spreads and in which sort of disconnected places it appears, can I somehow start reasoning about what, at what outside external time did that, thing, uh, did, did that thing happen? So that's sort of answer to the second question. Answer to the first question is, uh, hmm, we are using RSS feeds to get this data. Um, the, basically, this is the data that is being um, made available to us through Spinner, which is the company that's scrolling the stuff. Um, they are trying to do as much as they can to correct for time zones and all these delays. I think because, like, so, I, I my, my sense, or what, what we did was, I think because of the scale and sort of bias towards English, I'm confident in time, let's put it that way. Right, and it's only like three hour time difference and so on. So I think we are all good. And it's all, again, it's all a relative time, right? It's when it occurred. I don't, I'm not making claims about what time of the day or anything like that. So time zones, in some sense, don't matter. And it's systematic error. If there is, right, yeah. But because it's relative time. Originally, I simply wanted to ask, what can we do against it? But let me be a little bit more explaining what I mean. Uh, information is a very important thing and personally I have to manage my information flow very carefully not to waste time uh -huh. but on the other side to get everything I have to know what you explained is a methodology how to analyze what happens mm -hmm. but the next step is of course what can we do with it mm -hmm. if I imagine 10 years later and the exponential curve grows we will have serious problems. 
Uh, I will leave Twitter and not Twitter anymore. Uh, I will select my emails much more carefully than I do today, etc. So I have to manage my information flow. On the other side, there are companies who have an interest to spread their information accordingly. So there are different interests. And one of the key issues and probably one of the main parameters in, in your approach is what I call media competency. In which way do people get the information, what are they doing with it, and how do they propagate it? Mm -hmm. And this, of course, depends on tradition, on education, on political media interests, etc. Is there a way to do something about all these things uh, to extend your approach accordingly? So I think these are like these are these are ex like ve totally valid and excellent points, right? So um, a few things. Um, what I was sort of showing was more this kind of global analysis of how the whole system works in some sense, right? I think what I also touched at the end upon with these recommendations is that you could sort of say, you personally, this is the min sort of this is what you should be reading so that you you are up to date early. What is also I think so this is again these are sort of analysis. Now if you go more to the personal level, I think the basic question you are asking is what will be the mode in some sense of information filtering and discovery, right? And for example, if you look at Twitter today, that's through, it's through social networks, it's through who you follow, right? It's, for example, except the trends that are there on the site, the only way for you to discover is to see what your people that you follow talk about, right? And through some kind of recommendations of who to follow, you can, you can make, you can sort of decide what is the stream of information that you are getting. But of course, it's very interesting to ask, okay, what kind of filtering can I, could I put on top? Um, uh, to even like make make the make the feed smaller, and I think like yeah, Facebook has the same problem with uh, with feed rank it, with uh, Facebook feed ranking, right? Again, what to show and what not to show. Um, so, but yeah, I I don't have any solutions yet. Um, yeah, I had a quick question on whether um, advertising agencies or lobbyists have been picking up. We work a lot with journalists, so so uh, we have collaboration with the uh, Pew Center for Excellence in Journalism. So this is like um, um, uh, 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 foundation in U.S. that is doing media studies, and how they traditionally do media studies is to have ten people employed, and they read the new newspapers every day and sort of hand hand mark and label what is being talked in newspapers. So, for example, with them um, we did uh, analysis of. Um, the, the media coverage of the current economic crisis um, and trying to see um, what, what were the main proponents of the debate and what were the main phrases that, that got the most attention in the media um, and uh, they were really excited and sort of we helped them with that. The other thing we were working on is uh, sex scandals in Catholic Church. Again, what are the phrases, who, who, who created them, when they were, when they were made, and so on. So um, journalists uh, get excited about this, and, most of, and I guess mostly because it's so simple, so there is not much magic going on. Um, now we are also yes, talking to a few um, marketing firms and so on. But it's all about getting good data. Um, uh, well, thank you one more time for this okay, thank for the you. talk. Thanks, everyone.